first of all, good morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Stephen Knight. I'm the CEO of Pimento. Um, many thanks for joining the third um, Pimento discussion, panel discussion of the year. So as you're aware, we've got a new brand name. We're using Marketing Spice Live, which is part of our portfolio content, which we'll be sharing across the year with you. Uh, multiple channels. Um, we're working now both in terms of webinars, uh, podcasts, um, creating papers, and uh, also engaging with you um, across both live and hybrid events across 22. So uh, it's good to see you, as many of you as you are. Um, if you know, if you're new to Pimento, look, I think there's a few people who are new to Pimento today, and, and thank you for, for coming along to one of our events. Uh, we are a network of just over 200 agencies and consultants, around 5,500 people in the UK. We work exclusively with independent agencies and consultants, and we put together bespoke teams on behalf of clients. Uh, so that's what we do, a little bit different. And we've been doing it now for 17 years. Um, if you weren't on our previous calls, also just to let you know that we will be recording it. Um, so um, we hope to be able to share that on our uh, catch up channel on YouTube. Um, and at the end of this call, we'll give you a link to it and we'll be publishing it later on today. Um, if you have a question, we want to make the session as interactive as we possibly can. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little, um, little chat box. If you put any questions in there, then as we go through today's uh, conversation uh, with, with Steve and with Kate, we'll um, invite you to actually pose your questions direct to them. Um, and hopefully we'll get to all of you as, as we go through the call and make it as interactive as possible. OK, so um, today, and it's really a great pleasure to have senior clients, always is, but it's, it's particularly pleasurable to have Steve Aluma with us today, who is the general manager of Bird's Eye UK and Ireland, uh, and Kate Gibson, managing partner at Circle. Um, we're going to be looking at the FMCG market, how it's, it's evolving, how Bird's Eye in particular are innovating their brand and really reflecting the changing demands of consumer habits and behavior here in the UK. Uh, Steve uh, is someone who has, has spent his life in, in the food industry, um, in, in frozen food in particular. Um, he's been with Bird's Eye UK and Ireland for a number of years, and he leads their branded business in frozen foods, which encompasses a number of brands. Bird's Eye, housewife's favorite, I don't think you can say that now, it's everyone's favorite. Stephen, you've accidentally put yourself on mute. What did I get to? Sorry, excuse me. Thank you for that. How far did I get? Someone tell me. It was only a couple of seconds. Okay, fine. Sorry, I was just explaining Steve's wonderful career in the frozen food industry. Um, so you say he's been at it for 25 years. Uh, he's previously marketing director. where he led the brand team that turned around the bird's eye um, brand delivering four consecutive years of growth and winning the coveted Grocer Award, uh, the Gold Award in 2019 for Brand of the Year. Um, it's an amazing um, succession of, of um, growth um, followed by a fantastic award for all his achievements. He's a passionate advocate for the frozen food industry and a long history at Bird's Eye itself. He started his career at Unilever and the graduate training program back in 1996, so he's classically trained before moving into marketing in 2002, where he saw the light. Uh, his highlights include the revitalization of uh, the Captain Bird's Eye, who we'll come on to talk about today as their brand icon. And he's worked on a number of acquisitions, integrating them into the, uh, the Bird's Eye family. And those include Goodfellas and Aunt Bessie's. Kate Gibson is managing partner at Circle. Um, they were recently awarded one of the industry's highest accolades, the PRCA Consultancy of the Year. So many congratulations to them. Kate leads the agency's highly regarded consumer brands division, which works with brands in the FMCG and retail space including an epic four year journey working with the bird's eye team. So uh, thank you, Kate, for organizing today's event and, and bringing Steve to us. It's, it's great to, to be able to work like this. She's passionate about the strategic role of PR and understanding consumer motivations to drive relevancy and trust in brands. And she has over 20 years experience, which is hard to believe looking at her uh, at agency side and has developed and led award winning creative communication campaigns for some of the UK's best known brands, including Dulux, John Lewis, Morrison's, Aldi, Cafe Nero, McDonald's, and Purcell. So we are in good hands. So I'm going to sort of kick off the conversation, if I may, just by bringing both Steve and Kate into the spotlight. So join me here. Hopefully, I won't mute myself again, and we can get going. So first of all, welcome, and um, thank you for joining me and I covered. Um, I'll start with Kate, if I may. Um, now, the market is changing, and it's changed for a number of reasons. Can you kind of give us a, a brief overview of what the main 
drivers for change are within the UK FMCG market, please? Um, yeah, it's, it's a massive topic. We could talk all day, couldn't we, just about this one this one question, I guess. I think e-commerce, like no, no surprises there, massive driver for FMCG as a whole. Um, you're going to hear from Steve a lot today. Obviously, he works in frozen food, and as an agency, we specialise in food, drink, and retail. Um, and so specifically in relation to that, I think there's a few kind of really key things that we're going to touch on today. I think the first is health and nutrition. Um, and the big responsibilities that brands are facing right now to kind of really help consumers to improve their health. And it's, it's a real golden opportunity in the next decade to do that. Um, and that's the topic of today is kind of how brands are going to continue to innovate um, their product ranges to meet those needs specifically. I think as an agency, particularly, we are navigating HFSS restrictions, which are coming in later this year, which is really challenging for a lot of brands in the food sector, particularly. We represent confectionery brands um, and trying to plan comms for brands in that space is very challenging. Um, and again, there's a massive responsibility for those brands to kind of help signpost the category better when it comes to healthier options. There's still a lot of consumers out there that don't know how to navigate traffic light labels. They don't understand the difference between different types of fat. Um, and there's still a really big job to do there as well. Um, and the salt reduction journey continues as well. So Birds Eye UK has done masses of work in this space with various brands and products. Um, but still 75% of the salt that consumers are um, taking in is from pre-packaged foods. So again, there's a big responsibility for brands in that space to, to get on that journey and help the, the nation to reduce their salt intake. Um, I'm probably going to talk about plant-based today, probably quite a bit, I imagine. Uh, so just kind of extending from health and nutrition, obviously no surprise, plant-based eating trend is just going to continue to grow. I think we've obviously just gone through Veganuary, um, and I think that's probably going to lose a bit of momentum in the sense that consumers don't want hardcore changes. They want things, changes to be accessible and flexible, hence flexitarianism. Um, and we're expecting a lot more kind of meat and dairy alternative brands and products to come up throughout the course of this year. Um, another key one, obviously I had to mention it, um, is sustainability. Um, that's probably going to come up in terms of questions today, I imagine, as well. Um, and the importance of kind of the changing definition of consumer value. So what I mean by that is kind of people thinking about brands in terms of how much they cost and being kind of very value and price driven. And I think that is going to be important this year, particularly in the context of what's going on in the world right now. Um, consumers are going to be really squeezed. So that is an absolute essential. But beyond that, look at what brands are doing to contribute to society and, uh, and particular sustainability as well. Um, and the vast majority of consumers now are being influenced in their food and drink purchasing decisions by sustainability issues. And it's brands' responsibilities to help them navigate that kind of sea of labels and carbon footprints and sustainability criteria and make those decisions much, much easier. Um, and that's where frozen food really comes in as a category. It's perfectly positioned to help in that space. Thank you, Kate. And uh, kind of building on that, you know, clearly one of the key things that sort of changed the landscape has been the fact we've had obviously two years of, of you know, um, of the pandemic, you know, and that presumably is, is changing people's consumption habits, but also is it changing them what they eat and where they eat it? Yeah, yeah, massively. And I think um, something else really interesting that we've noticed here is, is the role of British brands in this as well. And I think obviously during the course of the pandemic and now what we're seeing in the world today and kind of very serious events, there is a real sense of nationalism in, in a positive sense when it comes to brands. And there's lots of nostalgic British brands that are really on the rise again because they provide a sense of comfort to consumers and people are turning back to brands that they know and trust. Um, and fortunately for us as an agency, we represent a lot of brands in that space. It's been a really interesting journey to work on their comms. Um, and we're really seeing that appetite from British media as well. Um, and I think that's only set to continue, but I think it's those brands still can't just rely on legacy names. They need to kind of continue to innovate and look at consumer motivations and make sure they're continuing to adapt rather than harking back to the past. Um, but when it comes to kind of the pandemic and kind of the key things that we've seen, obviously there are masses of social restrictions that we've all faced over the last couple of years. And it's been the brands that have prioritized convenience and digital services and comfort at home that have really kind of won through. So it'll be no surprise kind of brands like Royal Mail, Ocado, ASOS, they were three of the fastest growing brands last year um, because obviously consumers were, demand for delivery services went through the roof. Um, and I had a stat here about Just Eats brand was worth 
reckoned to be worth about $6.6 billion last year, which again, is just reflects kind of the need for um, specialist delivery services during that time as well. Um, but in terms of e-commerce, the whole food, the whole food system was massively impacted, whether that was lockdown of the hospitality industry, panic buying, toilet roll initially did, <laughs> did very, very well, probably not subsequently while everyone was using up their supplies. Um, masses of demand for food delivery um, and home cooking as well. And e-commerce was naturally disproportionately impacted by that. Um, and retailers had to scale up very, very quickly to manage that, that demand and double their, their online capacity overnight. Um, and there were 59% of, of shoppers were actually purchasing grocery products online during the pandemic. That's reduced slightly since, now, since then, but it, it really probably is there to stay. Yeah, well, if, I bring that, I mean, Steve, if you want, I can bring that alive a bit to, in terms of how, yeah, in, in a more narrow sense, how we saw. So, I mean, during the pandemic, what we actually saw, because people had a stock up mentality, there was a big spike in the sale of freezers. So people having households usually have one freezer integrated with their fridge, right? But, uh, many, you know, the sales of uh, freezers went up 50% uh, in 2020 because people wanted that extra extra storage. And, you know, that's permanent capacity. So you know, that's always been the limiting factor for a category like ours. To have, so to have like almost like pretty much 100% increase in in-home capacity, and if it's in the freezer, it will be consumed. But if you consider that the nation's children were at home for, for months, right? So all of a sudden at lunchtime, uh, there was an extra meal a day to provide whereas children would other, otherwise be at school. So there was a massive spike in consumption. So at, at its peak, there were 83% more occasions featuring frozen food. And in particular, the, the, the kind of children's food. So 98% more fish finger occasions at lunchtime, for example, 70% more, 74% more pizza occasions. And, the, and, and uh, you know, clearly kids went back to school, but a lot, a lot of those habits have remained. So, so if you look at the percentage of meals that feature frozen post pandemic, it stayed, it's, it's definitely gone up uh, versus pre pandemic. Pre pandemic, it might have been 10, 11%, and now it's like 14, 15%. So it's, it's some, some permanent changes as, as we move to hybrid working, uh, for example. But just to, just to contextualize that point on e commerce as well, uh, it was probably around 12% of our business was sold through e commerce before the pre the pandemic and that double that more than doubled so it, it probably went to about 25 26 percent uh, so it's a one in four uh, pounds spent on our on our products through e-com and that that has big big implications big changes big opportunities because the way our brands are presented in e-commerce is is far more flexible versus the constraints of a freezer aisle in store but even post pandemic yes it's fallen back back a little bit but only down to 23 percent so it's still, you know, kind of from 11 to 25, 26, down to 23, and it's kind of stayed at that new level. So what it's really done is accelerated. It was obviously going up, but accelerated trends that were already developing, which we've seen in a lot of other industries as well, right? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that obviously I, I was aware of the fact that everyone's going out and buying freezer space, but actually that gives you that long-term um, legacy and opportunity, I guess, to keep filling those freezers. And that must be massively important. It's almost like having another 10 million homes. And you suddenly got <laughs> a, yeah. larger, a larger market and a bigger opportunity to, and to, to feed the nation. Um, and certainly you have to, I mean, the hybrid and the ways of working, um, we've seen as an industry within the communications and marketing industry that, um, you know, hybrid working um, structures are evolving um, slowly. Um, so actually, you know, a lot more people are still continuing to work three, four days a week from home. Um, yeah. A number of agencies are getting people in slowly. Um, and that has to be, again, a, a good news for you. Um, as, as more people continue to actually eat from home, there's more opportunities for them to cook uh, rather than sort of pick up food on the run. What I wonder is, obviously, with that rise in consumption and you know, with uh, food price inflation also on the rise, is it likely that the, the cost of the raw materials and the cost of living will impact upon um, the price at the, at the, at the tills? Are we seeing that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take one. Yeah, I mean, inflation is is impacting um, all parts of the FMCG industry, and it's it's you know it's in two ways, right? People have less disposable income because of their broader broader inflation in energy costs, you know, well publicised, obviously, and then the 
the products and the food itself is inflating, driven by the cost of raw materials, cost of labor, logistics, fuel. It's, 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 it's at a pretty high level, and we, we are seeing that come through in the prices consumers are paying. And I think different industries uh, are impacted in different ways. In, in, in the case of frozen uh, food, it's actually a pretty resilient category. So in tougher economic context and when shopper pockets are squeezed, Frozen is actually quite well positioned because even if it is becoming more expensive as everything else is, it still offers fantastic value for money. So what I think we'll tend to get is a bit le less eating out and a little less on, on chilled and fresh food that, 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 that tends to be uh, you know, a bit more expensive and we'll get more in-home eating occasions. And so if you, if you can offer help offer experiences uh, and solutions, it can be really favorable for sales in spite of inflation. So I'll give, I'll give an example, just one example to bring it to life. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to order a pizza in from a, a well-known, I won't name a uh, sort of a pizza delivery company. So a, a standard 11 and a half inch pizza, pepperoni pizza, it costs you 17.99, okay, to get to, to, to buy that for your family, a pepperoni pizza. If you were to buy a Goodfellas pizza, uh, same size, it would cost you £3.50. And, you know, really good quality for products. So you could buy five, uh, you know, five uh, products from the supermarket, five of our pizzas from the supermarket and, and have, have change left over versus getting a takeaway. And you can feed your family in that way. In the, in the same way, if you, if you go on many of the e-com offers uh, and sites now, you'll have offers like fill your freezer for £10 or buy five you know, selection of products for five pounds where you'll be able to get really great quality, you know, fish, you know, really good for your food, fish, chicken, vegetables, um, and, and feed your, your family in a, in a, in a very uh, positive and, and, and nutritious way. And even though as a brand, we operate a, a, a premium uh, to, 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 for example, the private labels, it's still fantastic value for money in absolute price terms. So, uh, and our ability to on, offer bundles across categories and products um, is, is a benefit. And then when you la layer on top of that, some of the trends Kate was talking about in terms of sustainability, or well, you know, food waste, when, pe when people are, are trying to economize, food waste is another big topic, right? And again, we, in Frozen, we're well positioned for that because there is no food waste. Um, so yes, it's, it's, you know, there's definitely inflation. It's, 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 it's one of the biggest topics facing both food brands and FMCG at large, uh, it's, it's, and it's quite high as well, actually. And it's, we, we've been, you know, the last 10, 20 years, we haven't, we, we've been used to quite stable uh, pricing. So we are gonna have to get used to this being a bit more of our reality over the next uh, year or two, I think. I, given your product obviously is popular with, with all demographics, but I guess in particular, um, it tends to be popular with um, socio-demographics that tend to be probably slightly lower in, in terms of the pay scale. Um, might be hard to be wrong here, and by the way, I'm making a massive jump, so that's assumption here. But um, the, the sorts of increases that we're likely to see, are, I guess, a double digit across um, all of your key items, and, and obviously you're not alone in that. Um, you spoke about the fact that obviously people trade down from eating out and, and they eat more at home and you know, with the increase in freezer space, it's more likely that actually they'll be able to enjoy that opportunity. But are you seeing any trading down within your own categories? I mean, people trading down from bird's eye to, as you say, private label? No, no, we're, we're not because, um, you know, all, all manufacturers, and that includes private label, um, are, are experiencing inflation at the moment. So it's, you know, it's all, it's all kind of relative and, and quite proportionate. And in fact, you know, what we're seeing is at the, at the real, and you know, this is being publicized a bit, but that real kind of ed entry budget level, because they're starting from such a low base, they're having to inflate in, in, in percentage terms even more, right? In the value ranges. Um, so it's not, it's not something, you know, that if, if you were to look at our market share, for example, which is a good measure of whether people are trading down or not, um, it's not something yet that we're seeing. Now, clearly, as, as budgets squeeze, then we might start to see that, a bit of that. But as I said, given that we, it still offers great value for money relative to other food choices that you have 
in terms of either eating out or, or, or chilled fresh categories, which tend to be quite significantly more expensive. Where it's quite well positioned. If, you, if, you're gonna, if you are gonna trade down, then there's a bit of, well, I'll buy the, the premium brand within it and it's still offer, I can still afford, it's still affordable. Uh, uh, but, you know, just on your point on breadth, um, of course, you know, relative to some of the more kind of value ranges that the retailers offers, we, we, we have a slightly kind of higher income demographic, but we still uh, have huge reach. So it's 85% of households um, buy one of our brands at least once a year. So we really do, um, and we make an effort to offer not only a broad range of products, but also different value offerings at different price points. And you can still, there's, there's, there's still a huge section of our portfolio that you can buy really great quality chicken or fish for under two pounds, which is, uh, or vegetables for under two pounds. So really get a nutritious, high quality option uh, for your family. Okay, well, I mean, just turn to, to turn to nutrition. And actually, uh, I've got a, a question here from, from Ashley Graham. Ashley, are, are you able to, to pose your question to Steve, please? Yes, of course. Uh, so... On the Bird's Eye UK website, there is a big section on recipes and nutrition, and that's great. It's something which I've modelled work on when working with previous clients like uh, McCain in a previous role. Is that translating into a lot of extra uh, revenue coming in to your business through like the shopping tools function on the website? Or is it more translating into uh, just people picking up the product at a supermarket? Yeah, I mean, first and first and foremost, um, it's about giving consumers inspiration and ideas, right? So, you know, when they're when they're coming to our website, they're either looking for functional information around nutrition or sourcing or sustainability or or such the like, or they're looking for ideas. So, it's part of our responsibility of a brand, you know. Um, in a micro sense consumer habits in terms of meals don't change that much you know there's a repertoire right of five favorite meals within a family a spaghetti bolognese and a shepherd's pie and a roast dinner and what have you but uh, provide meal providers parents uh, in, in the case of families are still looking to give new ideas and twists and turns so the more the more uh, we can give them the more solutions we're provide, providing for them but also the more consumption occasions our food can, can go into so for example our chicken We've got a great chicken range, a product called Chicken Grills, which is like a, a marinated piece of uh, char grilled, like a char grilled piece of chicken. And, uh, you know, classically it might be served with some wedges and some vegetables or whatever. And we've got a whole host of things where you can have it in a top it into strips and have it in a wrap or in a fajita meal or tacos or chicken Caesar salad. Now, does that translate directly uh, into... Um, more sales. No, I think it's part of a broader mix. I don't think we can rely on that uh, alone because, uh, you know, the number of people actively going to a website versus, you know, the reach you get from a campaign. So is, is, is small, right? So I think we rely on both, you know, our conventional advertising and above the line messages, but in particular in, in, our, in our digital advertising to, to reinforce those. So, so at the moment, we've got a great partnership, for example, with Twisted, uh, on our fish fingers business so you know, one of the passion points uh, with our brand is fish finger sandwiches and that's 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 really an area that we saw a big increase in lunch consumption especially amongst adults uh, and 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 with, we're we're running a competition where we've got a kind of western england versus eastern england coming up with recipes for different fish finger sandwich ideas and then north versus south and then there'll be a there'll be a champion and that kind of stuff always not only gives people ideas, but it engages people, it entices people and inspires people to enjoy our products in, in more creative ways, which, which obviously we love because then it turns from a more, evolves from a more fun functional backup purchase in the freezer when you run out of that. If you look you know, 10, 20 years ago, Frozen was a bit more of a kind of apologetic category and something that, that was a stock up item to something more interesting and modern and inspiring. Um, so yeah. Uh, to, to simplify, it plays a role, but only in, in the context of a broader mix. Okay, I think Jean has got a, a point she'd like to, to raise as a build on that. Jean. Yeah, excuse the background noise, there's a builder here today, really sorry. Um, yeah, I work in the, the field of data and data collection, 
Um, and what we're always trying to do is work out what people's behaviors are. A lot of my customers are in this golden hour before Google pulls up the drawbridge on third party data. And what we're seeing is people using these top, top of funnel approaches, um, getting people onto the website, giving them something maybe downloadable, a, a recipe that they could download or, or nutritional information that they wouldn't have had before, certainly coupons, um, to use them, these, these ploys to actually capture that first party data to allow you to market in the future. Is that something that you've considered at Birdseye? I'd say not, not necessarily vis-a-vis -vis related to search and Google, more directly, uh, I would say, in collaboration with our retailers. So clearly, you know, our retailers collect a lot of shopper data through Clubcard, Nectar, uh, you know, Asda just launching their, you know, their, their equivalent as well. So that, that gives us some more very direct uh, tools to uh, speak to, uh, to have an ongoing dialogue through their uh, channels. We don't collect any of our own uh, data, third party uh, data or consumer data because we've got, because we've got such big penetration. We, we, we prioritize that kind of reach versus uh, personalization and one-to-one -one relationships. We find that kind of more efficient and effective, but where possible with our retailers and in our collaborations, we can, we can clearly work with them where there are specific uh, marketing or trial or or retention objectives that we might have for our brand. So your your data is broader based and it's able to then pinpoint and target the specific consumer that way. Yeah, um, within the context of shopper uh, shopping behaviour more than uh, through uh, kind of communications, if you like. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jean. Um, I want to move on to talk a little bit about um, sustainability. Obviously, it's a core part of. of um, any um, brand these days, and obviously you buy a lot of fish. Um, so I'd be really interested to understand you know, what impacts um, and what's the reality of, of fishing and, and how do you manage that in terms of where you, you, where you fish your fish? Sure. So yeah, fishing for definitely does have an impact in sustainability if you don't do it in a sustainable way. <laughs> So that's why uh, you know, we make, and we have done for, for well, dec two decades now, very, very strict choices on where we source our fish. So when, when uh, Bird's Eye was owned uh, by Unilever, um, we partnered with, with, with WWF to, to form the, uh, the MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council. And the Marine Stewardship Council is the leading independent global authority on sustainable fish. And 100% of the fish that is sold through our brand is, comes from MSC sourcing. So that, that is a, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, taking a step back, when it comes to sustainability, sustainability is around actions, you know, actions speak louder than words. And, you know, ultimately consumers will judge you and what you do and vote for that. And, you know, these, these actions and the choices you make cost. So we've made the choice to only source from MSC sources because we know that that is the most rigorous, uh, the rigorous, pro the most rigorous process for in ensuring the future sustainability uh, of our fish, which, which is quite fundamental for our business because if we don't, there won't be any fish to sell ongoing, right? Uh, and if you look at what the MSC do, um, they're very rigorous, so it's quite hard to become an MSC fishery. They ask questions, very science-based questions, and they use third-party independent auditors of these fisheries to look at, you know, firstly, are there enough fish left in that ocean that can that is a level that it can replenish itself indefinitely, right? So that's first and foremost a kind of marker for sustainability there. Secondly, what are the environmental impacts within that? A fishery and, and, and is that fishery minimizing that? So that means, you know, how much does it disrupt uh, other species and habitat so that that ecosystem can remain healthy for those species? And then does that fishery comply with uh, relevant laws and changing environmental circumstances? So there's quite a lot of hoops that fishery needs to jump through to get that certification, such that I think it's only between 10 or 15% of the world's fisheries uh, have that MSC certification more in the whitefish world, which is where we operate. So, so we're we're you know 
to use a pun, we're having, we, we can only fish in a very in a much smaller pool from that point of view, which costs us more, but it's the way we have a sustainable business and it's, and it's the right thing to do. If you, can, uh, if you can manage it that way, fish is a very sustainable and replenishable uh, resource, natural resource and source of protein, because it doesn't need, it's not like a kind of animal-based protein where you need to farm it and all the resources associated with that and all the industry with that, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a natural resource, but you need to, we need to respect it. Now, obviously there's the other half of that, which is aquaculture as well. And a lot of the fish, you know, the biggest species in, in the UK uh, is salmon, right? Which we don't sell salmon, but that's the biggest species in the fresh, in the chilled aisle. And all of that is farmed. So it's important within farm fished as well. And there's, there's a similar standard, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, that uh, in, in terms of how the fish are kept and fed and the welfare of the fish, that it's as rigorous as the, as the MSC. Um, but it's, it's very important for us. It's a key, you know, it's a key reason why, it's a choice we make. It's a reason why we charge more and, and people pay more because it's, it's a choice in order to offer a sustainable option, which is something consumers rightly uh, expect from us. Uh, and, and, and that's a key part of our, our overall purpose in terms of, you know, how we serve the world with better food, which is how we articulate our purpose. It's around, it's around all the things that, that Kate spoke about at the beginning, you know, health and nutrition is, is critical to us, uh, sustainability, and then, the, and then the kind of plant-based trend as well. I mean, as a build on that, you're sort of saying that only 10% of the, of the fisheries around the world have got this standard. Um, and 10 to 15, yeah. Okay, so then, the, the, and, and you're buying all your fish at sea, as opposed to, to, to the farm sources. Um, when there are um, you know, changes in both the oceans and the population of fish, or there is either a political um, activity that you know makes it difficult for you to be able to source in certain environments. Um, I guess you're more limited in terms of where you can go because there just isn't that many you know seas to fish in. So does that then have a knock-on impact on on supply chains, or is there enough you know arrangements around the world for you to be able to actually swap? You know, fishing in a particular part of the world. Sure. That's where. Sure. Well, two things to mention on, on, on that point. Firstly, on, on the first point, those fisheries have to kind of reapply uh, for their MSC uh, accreditation on a regular basis in order to maintain it. So once they've got it, they ca you can't take it. So, it's, so if there is a change in either the environmental circumstances in legislation, then the process accounts for that. The second thing is, um, is there's a pipeline. So um, whilst there's you know 10 to 15 percent, you know, in, in, in our in our fish, white fish, it's, it's more around 40 percent of the, the world's fishes that are MSC certified. There's a pipeline of what we call um, FIP, fishery improvement programs. So these are fisheries that are on that are on their way to um, becoming MSC certified. Yeah. So what we would anticipate over time is that actually uh, with, you know, an increased number of fisheries getting their, um, their house in order, then, 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 then there'll be more and more to fish from. But it's something that we need to be able to um, uh, react to as it evolves and be prepared for. I think aquaculture does need to play more of a role, uh, and even for us. I mean, half the, over half the world's fish now is... Um, is from aquaculture, okay? So you're talking um, salmon uh, in, in, in Europe, but you have species like Pangasius and tilapia that are big in other continents, not so much in Europe yet. And then obviously seafood and prawns. So as part of a long-term future, you could see a more diversified approach as well uh, to, to offer a broader range of species. Thank you. That's a very comprehensive answer. Thank you, I appreciate that. In, in terms of innovation, because we'll come back to bring Kate back into the conversation. Um, obviously, you take okay. when it comes to no, that wasn't at all. But I just wanted to both of you, you can talk about fish in much more detail than me. Well, don't get me in a park <laughs> talking about. Uh... We'll definitely come back to fish fingers in a moment. But now I want, want to understand. You know, you've got the key drivers we spoke about at the moment. How, how things are evolving and changing, and demands are changing, etc. Um, in terms of innovation, both in terms of packaging and design and serving um, solutions. Um, how do you go about innovating? Because a lot of the products that you sell, you know, are, are staples, have been with us for many, many years and are well loved. And actually, you know, you wouldn't mess with them because um, if you mess with them, you know, you well, 
find out actually um, you, you impact on your success. But more generally, are, are you looking to create um, and innovate in this space? It's to both of you. So that question for Steve. You can't speak on behalf of Birds, but I'm sure as an agency, you uh, give sound advice in this, in this area. Well, yeah, and, and, yeah, and I, I mentioned at the beginning, I think we, you know, we work with a lot of British brands. You know, they've got legacy names and kind of full circle of life brands that we kind of grew up with and we're now serving to our families, but they, they can't rely on that. So they're all having to adapt. They're all having to look at kind of either renovating existing products that consumers love or, or look at innovation as well. And there's been an awful lot that Birdseye's been doing in the space around obviously health, um, health, nutrition, plant-based protein in particular, um, on the point around fish, I know Steve talked about sustainability and kind of packaging that is much more kind of open and transparent with consumers about where their food is coming from is absolutely key. So the fish range for Birdseye in 2021, the packaging was overhauled and renovated. Um, so it was much clearer for consumers about where their fish was coming from. Um, and there was a QR code put on pack so that consumers could actually um, see through the fish tracker tool exactly where their fish was being sourced from um, supply chain wise. So there's been a lot of work done in that space to be much more transparent with consumers. And what about the, to... the ingredients themselves, Steve? Are you, are you, you know, reducing salt or looking at alternative ways to improve flavour? Or... Yeah, I mean, that's, that's to be honest, that's been a, a lifelong uh, endeavour uh, over the last 20, 25 years to Firstly, reorientate reorientate our portfolio to to healthier, more sustainable uh, products per se, and then secondly, on that journey to uh, ensure that what we offer is 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 nutritionally positive and balanced. So, um, when I started in the business many moons ago, we had a big uh, red meat you know red meat business, ready meals business, um, and we've over time we've uh, you know selling beef burgers for example, right. Um, over time, we've reoriented our portfolio and focused our investment in both in R and D and in marketing on the healthier on healthier categories. So, you know, if you look, if you were to look at our marketing spend, it's focused around uh, you know products that, from a consumption point of view, the government would be encouraged more consumption of. So, it's vegetables first and foremost, right? So, people aren't getting their five a day. And we offer, you know, peas, obviously, and steam fresh vegetables, which is a very great way of getting a range of, you know, locked in goodness veg, uh, plant protein, and our launch of green cuisine uh, three years ago, which has been big success, and fish. You know, if you look at the fish, the guidelines in terms of both, uh, you know, what's good for your health. Two, two portions of fish a week is the recommendation, and we get about 1.1, 1.2 portions. So, you know, though. And then, and then chicken, which is quite a healthy source of protein, and from a sustainability point of view, uh, relative to other things, you know, red, lamb, pork, uh, beef is 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 you know, far far less input resources going in. But you know, at the same time, we have been on a journey of moving to healthier oils for frying our products, reducing salt levels in a very gradual way, in in a way that a consumer wouldn't notice over a five, ten year period. And we're in a great position, to be honest. So. Kay mentioned the HFSS legislation, uh, the high fat sugar salt legislation, which may restrict uh, brands uh, in their categories from either advertising or promoting, price promoting their products uh, on, a, on a cabinet end in a, in a retailer. And actually with, with the changes we've made uh, and the changes we are making, um, we're really well positioned for that. We see that more as an opportunity. Uh, and and you know, we, we see it as just another um, tailwind in the in, for frozen in a way because because it's it's great stuff. There's no preservatives. You don't need. There's this there's this kind of myth around preservatives with frozen that well how can it keep that long? You must put loads of preservatives in it, and it's actually the complete opposite. The fact that it's frozen means you don't need any preservatives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you also um, you know you manage both uh, the the Aunt Bessies and the Goodfellas brands. Yeah, and, and, you know which products I guess are some are occasional Aunt Bessies arguably. Um, and, but Goodfellas firmly would be, you know, back in the, the convenience food space. Um, are you looking at the kind of makeup of your products in those two categories too? Are you looking to weigh find ways to reduce the fat and sugar? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're already we're already in a good position within that range because we have a range of offerings that are already non-HFSS. 
that either have high protein content or vegetables or what have you. But uh, we've been doing we've been doing some great work actually on on a reformulation of our our core products today. The, either e even the most kind of popular product, and we we we're confident we can get them to the play to a place where they'll be a healthy meal choice as well. Uh, it just needs some. Um, there's a bit of science in it in terms of understanding taste and texture and you know maintaining because you know when people have a pizza right it's an indulgence it's 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 delicious it's tempting right so you want to keep all of that but there are things there are, there, 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 there we've got some great chefs in home who, in house who have developed a way of maintaining all of that but actually improving the nutrition content uh, that that actually if you were to test it before and after you'd actually be uh you'd struggle to tell the difference which is quite incredible so that's quite a game changer for us actually um and and on arm bessies um all of the core products that we make yorkshire puddings roast potatoes parsnips this kind of thing all of them are already non-hfss uh, they've moved away from palm oil we produce salt they're already kind of good solid nutritional choices so again, which reinforces uh, we're in a good position. And all the products, of course, there will be products that will never be non-HFSS. Um, so for example, uh, you know, pies, right? A chicken pie, everyone likes chicken pie with mash. Well, I don't know if everyone likes that, but nice comfort food with mash and peas and gravy. That's never gonna be HFSS, HFSS, but we don't invest in it. It's not a drive category. It's been reducing, um, but there's still a need there but it's, it's it's becoming a smaller and smaller part of our portfolio and by the end of the year we'll be over 90 percent of our portfolio will be a uh, healthy meal choice yeah. well, and that, that's a massive transformation in a relatively short period of time and, and clearly when it comes to the financials that that's coming through i mean many people probably don't know that um the business is now part of a much larger group uh, nomad who, whose brands also include people like finders and, and igloo um, and last year, the group as, as a whole reported a 15% in earnings per share, 3.6% increase in revenues. Uh, that's a stunning performance. I mean, Bird's Eye's contribution to, to the overall size of the, of the, uh, of the business, is, is, is that something that is, um, I don't know where you publish that, or is that something you can talk about? And how's, how's the business performing in, overall? In the yeah, company? yeah, I can give an outline of that. So, um, I mean, Bird's Eye, well, our UK business, so incorporating Bird's Eye, Goodfellas and Aunt Bessie's, is, is the biggest market within, within our broader group of Nomad Food. So we, we account for just, just around 30% of the, of the total um, group scale. And we've been a key part of the, in the last few years, we've, we've had a fantastic growth run, quite frankly. So that's been driven by the organic growth of Bird's Eye um, in, in the last five years and the journey we've been on there. And the launch of green cuisine under the brand is creating a new pillar plus acquisition so just to put some numbers to it so in in 2016 so the first sort of one of the first four years of ownership under our new ownership uh the business delivered around 450 million of sales uh, branded sales but through that uh organic growth and the acquisitions and, the, and, and the such the like last year we were 785 million so uh, you, you're talking on you're talking an annual compounded growth rate every year on average of eleven of eleven percent a year, and our share of, of the market increasing from around thirteen percent of the market in, in 2016 to over twenty percent of the market now. So it's been on a on a great run. Clearly, last year the whole of the market saw a decline of around five percent because we lapped a massive lockdown in 2020 when everyone was at home, so things started to unlock. But if you take that two year view, which is always uh, really important. So, you know, 2021 versus 2019, the, cra the category grew by uh, over 10, 10%. And we grew as, as our brands uh, with Birdseye uh, more than that. So uh, around 12, 12, 13%. So we've, we've done, you know, over the two year period, obviously we had a bit of decline, but not as much as the market uh, last year. But we still see the long term trend uh, as going really in a positive uh, direction. And that's been driven by, you know, all of the all, all three of the brands, quite frankly. Yeah. I can only imagine you Lieber must be beginning to start kicking themselves for actually letting you go in the first place. But they, they... <laughs> um, like we spoke about fish fingers, which I know is iconic and uh, certainly um, you know, one of those products that basically everybody 
Um, most people love the borough. Um, you spoke about the fact you're actually running competitions now between North East, West, East and South on yeah. how to design the very best uh, uh, finger sandwich. Um, as a connoisseur in the category, I'd, I'd like to understand for both of you, uh, what, what is the ultimate fish finger sandwich? And what would you recommend? Oh, we're not going to agree on this, Stephen, are we? I know it already. <laughs> so, bit squidgy white bread and lots of tartar sauce. It's controversial. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's two camps. So, um, you know, some people prefer more elaborate. I mean, the only answer you can give is it's a very personal choice, how you enjoy them, right? Everyone's got their own, thinks they have the best answer. <laughs> but, you know, they tend to, 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 to stem from... Uh, spread from a classic. So if you were to look on our uh, our website, and, and as was mentioned earlier, the recipes, our classic fish finger sandwich would be white bread, buttered with shredded lettuce, fish fingers, and drizzled uh, with ketchup. I actually, which I, you know, which I adore. I actually like uh, slightly more elaborate uh, ones and just trying different things out. So last last week, because we're running an internal competition at the moment, I, um, I, I and I come from like Cypria, Greek, uh, origin. So I made a, 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 a I made a fish finger pitta pitta with Greek salad and feta, a drizzle of olive oil and lemon, and uh, you know it was a sunny day, so I ate it outside, with, and 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 that that I loved as well. So you know my any olives or any feta in that or what's that? Sorry, yeah, olives, yeah, yeah some Kalamata <laughs> olives, some capers, Brilliant. probably a bit poncy to be honest, but um, a lot of effort, but it was absolutely delicious, and uh, yeah. I, the classic, you always come back to the classic and everyone will have their own classic, but, you know, always encourage people to experiment as well. You can have a lot of fun with that. You can. Just don't try and do it with sourdough bread. There's too many holes in all the... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it comes flying through. Uh, yeah. Captain Birdseye, um, you know, he's been um, around for, I don't know, 50 odd years. I mean, he's an amazing character and, and somebody you've developed over time um, from the sort of original lovable grandfather to where we are today with this Italian actor appears to be more like a dark coke hunk than uh, perhaps um, the, the one that we all remember. Um, I, obviously, you know, I'm not going to say what made the change because I know you brought him back and obviously you had to bring him back with a new actor, but was it a deliberate strategy to go for somebody who was going to have a, a very wide appeal um, beyond, uh, beyond kids or is, or is that something just was something that was picked up by the media after, after you made the selection? I, I, I mean, I think it was something that was picked up on the media after his selection. So we didn't, you know, it's funny that you, you described him as a, a diet coke punk. So I think he would love that himself, actually, being described as that, knowing, you know, knowing him personally. But uh, that, that was, certainly wasn't the intention. So when we brought him back, which was after 10 years, being off air for 10 years, actually, uh, we had to do that very careful, carefully and treat that with massive consideration. But what we wanted to do is, on the one hand, keep everything that was... Um, that resonated with consumers about Captain Bird's Eye, especially the kind of physical attributes, the white beard and the, and, and the outfit, but also jettison, to use a, a, a naval uh, a term, all of the potential uh, bag, baggage, which might kind of um, represent the past of Bird's Eye. So bring him up today. So classically, if you think when we were growing up, it was, it was, a, it was, a, bit, it was a good old jolly kind of... Um, you know, song or ditty on a on on a on a boat full of kids with their with their little pipe, you know, little naval outfits and a big big platter of this ridiculous mountain of fish fingers, uh, the golden treasure and all that kind of thing. And we didn't think that was right for the business. If you look, you know, again coming back to the trends Kate spoke about, you know, people are looking for real food and authenticity and, and quality, right? And fish fingers, a brilliant quality product. I'm so proud of the quality that goes into our fish fingers, both the quality of the fish, the breadcrumb. You know, everyone, everyone thinks it's, uh, we, it's colouring in the coating, and it's not. It's just paprika and cumin that gives it that colour. It's, it's natural spices, right? And they're really good for you, and they're good for your children. They give you omega-3. But anyway, you should never get me talking about fish fingers, Stephen, because I'll, I'll go on. So we wanted a character that would represent the fact that fish fingers are real food, and, and we make them quite simply. It's a very simple uh, product, really. So we wanted to go someone who who, who had the authentic, you know, who looked authentic, uh, and and could could be a symbol of quality uh, at sea, and and you know, catching the best fish and, and treating it in the right way, uh, and the rest of it, uh, and, and and hence we ended up with the, with the latest one. But we didn't really we didn't we didn't really pick him with that 
uh, no, there'll be this after, this after. But it, but it really did, uh, not only did it resonate with consumers bringing him back, but it did have this other kind of unintended, uh, I think it was in Grazia on the chart of lust, it was number one on the chart of lust, day, right? In the week of launch, which is something yeah. I don't think we manufactured or, or pushed, it's something that just happened uh, organically. Um, so, you know, that's a bit of fun. And we, what's that, sorry? Something like James Bond, who, who's going to be the next Captain Birdseye. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know any truth in the rumour that you're applying for your own job there. Is <laughs> <laughs> Poor Steve, he gets this all the time. <laughs> I, I do get it all the time, and it's my fault because of the, the beard. But I think it's it's a bit like um, the parallel is a bit, a bit like people with their dogs, right? Over time, yeah. you know, people say they start looking like their dogs. So I, with me, because I've been there so long, maybe I'm, I'm starting to look a bit more like uh, our brand. But no, 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 not, not it's, it's subconscious, is it? It's it? It could be, it could be, yeah. but no one could be uh, Ricardo. That's his, that's his name, Ricardo, the, the guy Ricardo. who's now. Well, I we, hope he'll be with us for many years to come. And we, then, were so, we were so lucky as an agency coming on board at this time. So we came on board as Ricardo was brought in to Birdseye as well. And, and like Steve said, he was brought in to do a really specific job to communicate the product benefits and kind of the simply made message and what probably nobody expected was the massive media appetite and that you know the lust barometers around him and it brought in a whole wave of consumers excuse the pun that probably grew up a bird's eye but probably weren't feeding it to their children and um, it definitely drove masses of social, social conversation around mu with mums and we obviously used up to our advantage in a comm sense as well so he became a pin-up and we've done some great campaigns of bird's eye over the years um captain's calendar for christmas we created an aftershave called, called ahoy that ended up on bbc news and have i got news for you um we've had great fun with him and i think the business has been willing to be relatively brave within kind of some guardrails when it comes to captain bird's eye it's been it's been a real journey he's, he's absolutely gift isn't it in terms of how you can develop it so yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll deviate for five minutes and then and, um, and sort of walking towards sort of um Closing our conversation today, but one of the things that we've been tracking this in the agency world for the last few weeks, months, um, indeed, is the whole issue over um, the war on talent. And you know, agencies are finding it particularly difficult at the moment to both attract and retain talent. I just wonder, brand side, you know, is that something that you are really finding hard, Steve? You, is it is it difficult for you to to, to actually uh, both attract and retain talent in this market? It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, it's certainly we're certainly finding it's a it's a more competitive market than it has been historically. But um, you know, was, was discussing this a bit earlier actually. We we because of the because of the journey we've been on the last few years and this this kind of sense of rejuvenation and increased sense of purpose, but you know, proper purpose with with real substance and action to it in terms of. Uh, the role our category plays and our brand plays on very important issues, whether it's nutrition or sustainability or launching into plant protein, all things that are looking to make a positive contribution, you know, footprint on the world. We, we, we've actually become in a relative sense a more attractive, you know, we're attracting some great, great talent in the business in the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, it's been more of a function of the rejuvenation and also being part of this reasonably new business of Nomad Foods, which is only five or six years old and acquiring a lot of other frozen food businesses. So, you know, people could see it it's, it, as a really exciting, dynamic place to be. Because um, it's, it's, it's a leader in its field, but it's quite a small company, really, relative to some of the, the classic kind of global uh, players, the Unilever's Nestle's that are, you kind of get lost in. Because we have a quite a more focused portfolio and mission than that, that and, and purpose as well, and positive impact, that's attracting more people than we uh, we used to be able to attract. That's and hopefully that will continue. Very interesting. I mean, we're seeing with Gen Zs in particular, and, and, and the millennials, is that um, through one of our associated companies, which is a, a, a recruitment business, 75% uh, of the applications we're getting, the candidates coming to us, are actually looking to move client side from agency land. Um, so there's a real sort of trend there. Um, right. Interesting. Last question, if I may, um, for the day, and um, thank you once again, is uh, it's a test for both of you. And Bola, I don't know the answer to this. Is how much is a what's the price of a pack of peas? Oh, it depends. It depends on the pack size. <laughs> okay, 500, 500 grams. Well, well, we don't do a five hundred gram size, but I'll tell you the uh, the eight hundred grams, which is the main pack. Okay. 
So that's uh, two. Well, firstly, important to say prices at discretion of retailer. We don't set prices, right? So that's that's down to our retailers. Get that out of the way quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Legal disclaimer. But an eight hundred gram of, of of garden peas uh, would 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 cost two pound thirty. So that's ten portion of peas because the portion's eighty grams for twenty three p. So that's that's great value for money, quite frankly. And clearly, if you you can go for petit pois as well, if you want to go a bit. A little bit more uh, premium, yes. and that would save you back three pounds twenty-five for nine hundred and sixty grams. I don't know why you want to know that question. Well, I'll have to see whether Kate can get anywhere near it than the agency side, but you've already told her the answer, so there you go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> brilliant! Listen, I want to thank both of you. It's been a fascinating insight into into your world, and it's been great to understand some of the uh, the pressures and how you've actually evolved the business over the last three or four years. Um, clearly, this is a business that's worth following, um, probably investing in, although we're not allowed to say that, but you know, Nomad clearly, you know, you, you are doing some great things and just looking at consumer trends and, and where healthy eating is going, you're, you're ahead of the curve there. So I really would like to wish you well and, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Steve. Thank you to everyone who actually uh, tuned in today. Uh, just a quick reminder, our next session is on the 23rd of March. It's with the Business Development Club, so all you BD, uh, BDs and agency owners, uh, please come to that. Fascinating insight, this one. It's a little bit different. We've got Clarion, who are members of Pimento. They're, they're lawyers. They're going to be talking about IP and IP protection and ghosting and how to protect and, and uh, utilise your IP uh, and protect your IP when it comes to your business. A real issue for agencies um, and something I, I think we could all learn from. So, uh, yeah, we've got the big guns out for that. So, once again, have, have a great day. Um, get back to me on the best recipes for how to have the perfect um, fish finger sandwich or any other sandwich you can think of and uh, I look forward to seeing you all very soon. I'd like to thank um, Ralph Mann who's been busily uh, illustrating and putting together something in the background there and we'll share that with you and the video as I say will get uploaded later on today. So uh, have a fantastic Wednesday and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.